Good afternoon, everyone, and hello from a fairly cold London. And firstly, thank you very much to the SIMM for giving us the opportunity to present to you today on the economics of project development, a very important subject which we are all extremely interested in. The, this is the third and last in the series of seminars which started with decision analysis in the mining industry, followed up with productivity in the mining industry, and today we're going to talk uh, specifically about projects and project evaluation. I'm delighted today to be joined by my co-presenter, Matthew Jarvis, who you should be able to see on screen. Matthew has had as a mining engineer with a career in De Beers, PwC, South 32, and now as a colleague working in consulting. Matthew will be joining in on presenting some of the, the material, but in particular, we'll be looking at presenting the, the live demonstration model to illustrate some of the concepts that we're going to be presenting today. So without further ado, I'm going to um, share my screen and go straight into a few slides that we will talk to. Um, as previously, please feel free to um, add in any comments as we go along. We'll try and address them um, as we progress, but we will have approximately 10 minutes at the end to address any questions that you might have uh, might have arisen during the presentation or, or at the end of it. So again, welcome, enjoy it. It's these, it's keep it as informal as possible, I hope. And also what we are hoping is that this will spur some interest uh, and further ideas. And please feel free, as I'll say at the end, to get hold of either Matthew or myself if any of your questions aren't answered or if any do come up at the end. So secondly, um, I'm just going to make sure that I can advance. There we go. Those are your two presenters today. I'm not going to go through our um, CVs for you. You will all get a copy of these slides um, at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to, to read this uh, at leisure in your own time. Going straight into it, what we'd like to cover in, in today's webinar is firstly, some of this is a little bit of repetition from the first two webinars, but so I'll go through it reasonably quickly. I apologize to those of you who've seen these slides, but to those of you who haven't, please um, have a good look at them. And as we go into the new material, it, does, it is important that we, that we set the scene for the project development uh, in terms of the project pipeline. What are the key factors for project success? How do we value projects? And um, we'll have a look at the four cash flow streams, what key metrics we look at, and then a live demonstration. And in fact, uh, there's a number seven there, which we'll be finishing off just with a discussion on internal rates of return for greenfields and brownfields projects, and what the industry expectation or industry uh, actual um, IRRs have been and then we'll finish up hopefully within about 50 minutes. Those uh, pictures there, Ikati uh, is a diamond mine in Northern Can Canada, which I worked on in the 2000s, and Antamina is a polymetallic scone in Peru, uh, what at the time of its development was the single biggest capital development uh, in the world at $2.3 billion in around about the 2000. Um, bottom left is potash from the prairies, and there's been a lot of activity there recently. The point that I'm, I'm making is that valuation techniques and approaches are similar through any uh, commodity or commodity type with very, very critical differences and differences that are very dependent on the project pipeline. So let's Let's go straight to the project pipeline. The industry recognizes that there are phases of development. The critical ones that we recognize in developing a project are concept study, pre-feasibility study, feasibility, execution, and intern asset. 
prior to a concept study would be various activities undertaken, uh, which we would define in the minerals industry as exploration, advanced exploration, and then formally kick off a concept study, which many people recognize as the start of the project pipeline. Critically though, our value creation tends to happen, well, you could argue that it happens earlier on in advanced exploration or in exploration phases themselves, but the formal part of the value creation often starts in the concept study, gains impetus during the pre-feasibility, and then as we go into the feasibility and into execution and, and running an asset, we look at value delivery. That's when we actually extract the value out of our mineral assets that we are developing. At the same time, our thinking needs to change from initially strategic thinking through into what we would call divergent thinking. In other words, once we have uh, identified a project of interest that we know is, is positive in terms of being able to be economically feasible in the concept study, we then look at the range of options um, through the pre-feasibility study, through the divergent thinking. And then we choose a single option, which is an outcome of the pre-feasibility to study and optimize during the feasibility study, which is what we call convergent thinking. The valuation approaches that we use are linked to the project pipeline. They vary as we go through the project pipeline. And so our valuation models, as Matthew will be showing you a little bit later, have to be geared towards being able to firstly um, uh, recognize the, the pipeline and recognize the different way of looking at, at uh, projects through pre-feasibility. We're looking at a number of options is important. Into the feasibility, we're looking at a single option and a, a much higher level of detail is important. So going on to the next one, I won't go through this in detail. We've covered this before, but what are the key outcomes of, or the activities and outcomes of a project of concept pre-feasibility and feasibility? Firstly, the concept study. Do we have a project? Is there something that is consistent with our strategy? Does it value further investment to investigate the opportunity? Have we looked at a number of alternatives from a high level point of view? And have we got a plan for the pre-feasibility study? Importantly, have all opportunities and risks been identified? Typically, a level of engineering is accuracy on the capital estimate would be plus minus 20 to plus to minus 35%. In the pre-feasibility study, the critical thing that we're looking at there is have we identified the right range of options to identify the one key alternative that needs to be studied in the feasibility study. And also, of course, have all the risks and opportunities been identified and have we got a, a plan for the feasibility study. In the feasibility, the key outcome of that is do we, can we present a feasibility study for commitment of capital. As I'll show you, the cost of concept study, pre-feasibility and feasibility can mount up, especially when you are doing things like uh, demonstration plants, but they are small in comparison to the overall cost of execution. And so the critical thing from the feasibility study point of view is have we actually presented our case to justify commitment of capital? And do we recommend that for approval? Typically, a feasibility study would be about 10 to minus 15% uh, capital estimate uh, accuracy and pre-feasibility a little bit less, 15 to 25%. Moving on to uh, the value creation, the maximum value in the minerals industry is created from discovery to the end of pre-feasibility. That's a fairly broad statement, but if you look at the S-curve, it's fairly well accepted and in the minerals industry at the moment that that is where value creation does happen. It can be destroyed through poor project definition and what we call front-end loading, inadequate front-end loading. And that's really important if you look at the cost of a 
pre uh, concept pre-feasibility and feasibility study in terms of complexity and size, you can look at a percentage of the total capital as being expended on those studies shown in the left-hand side there. The value that we create can always be reset through technolo technological breakthroughs, brown, further brownfields or exploration, and through productivity step changes. <clears throat> Just in terms of what it costs us, for a billion dollar project, it could quite easily cost us up to $30 million to do this, the feasibility study. Important that we actually do this well, but more important that we actually make the decisions at the end of each phase correctly. And that's really what we're gonna be talking about. These are fundamentals of project success. There are many, and you will get a different list from different people. These are ones that I've found to be really, really worthwhile in many, many years of studying um, projects, of reviewing projects, and of being involved in projects and successful ones and non-successful ones. Firstly, single point accountability. It's important that we get a single person who to run a project, and especially for a Brownfields project, that that single person reports to a senior enough level in the organization that short-term um, uh, desires are not um, put in front of the long-term success of the project. Continuity of the key people is also important to the key people in your, in your project um, should stay with the project throughout the concept, pre-fees and feasibility as much as possible. Uh, turnover of key people has a significant deter de detrimental effect on the project outcome. You've got to have the right people in the project. That goes almost without saying. front end loading is a concept that um, many people now, most people now accept. And that's that we have sufficiently detailed studies in various, various different aspects of the, of the project um, so that we can then execute a lot more quickly. A uh, think tank based in Washington called the Independence Project Analysis has done statistical um, analysis of how well a project is studied versus the project outcome. Front-end loading is a key part of how well it's studied and you can translate with good front-end loading, you could add a couple of percentage points to your internal rate of return of a well-executed project based on the good front-end loading. Maximizing the, the investment is really important. Um, how to increase the NPV of, of a project, um, I think we'll talk a little bit about that. Maximizing or minimizing changes is also another key aspect. If you find that you're looking at major alternatives in a feasibility study, one should be absolutely ruthless and push that project back to pre-feasibility status. And then I can't overemphasize this enough, um, the need for independent reviews at each stage, tollgate stage, whenever major capital is committed or when one needs to progress from a concept to pre-feasibility study. Um, this, in my experience, has been the single biggest factor that has improved our project delivery over the last 20 years. So let's just talk about governance um, and how we go about valuing projects. When you can have a look at uh, the various valuation code separately. Samval is, I think, one of the, the best one out there, but there's also Valman and Simval, for example. All of them recognize three different approaches, the income, market, and cost approach, without um, making a judgment on which one's the most important. We will be focusing on the income approach, which generally gets used when we're valuing projects. The important thing at the bottom there is that every decision, large and small, needs to be valued. The mining industry is capital intensive. We spend roughly 20% of our market capitalization on capital projects 
Greenfields, Brownfields and maintaining our operations, every single project and every single uh, aspect of that, whether large for a billion dollar project or for a $50 million fleet replacement needs to be valued. Alternatives need to be looked at and we need to have a, a rigorous way of making our decisions as I talked about in the first seminar. If we move on, sorry, move on to the next one. This is what a, a typical simple model would look like for income approach. You have essentially four cash flow streams and those are production revenue, the capital expenditure, there's operating expenditure and taxes and royalties. And you can boil any financial model down however complex into these four cash flow streams. Out of that becomes a net cash flow and out of that you can calculate your metrics. We'll talk about those in a little bit more detail, but the key, the four, what I call the prime metrics are net present value, the internal rate of return, the payback period, and the capital efficiency ratio. And we'll get on to those now. I want to just have a look at those graphs in a little bit more detail. This is a simple model, so the, of an acid soluble copper, uh, project and you can see on the top left the cash flow streams firstly capital costs in blue ex usually expended all up front there's a little bit of blue in there which indicates your ongoing sustaining capital there's operating costs in shown in yellow those are shown below the line because they are cash out taxes are in red are shown below the line also cash out and your net cash flow is shown in green. And this example that we've shown you actually shows a positive net cash flow. So we would have a positive NPV. However, in the first couple of years, you'd have a cash flow deficit. And this is the important reason why we discount our cash flows because money of today, of tomorrow, is not equivalent to money of today, as we know with the time value of money. Typical production. Profile for an open cost mine, this um, would have ore mined, waste mined, and grade. This shows a nice smooth um, production profile. It doesn't always have to look like this and usually doesn't. Um, OPEX, you can see the main areas of expenditure in this particular example are how much it costs you to move your waste, how much it costs you to move your ore, that's mining, how much it costs you to process it. This is an SX solvent extraction electro winning project. So how much it costs you to get the copper into copper cathode. There's usually fixed costs, which are overheads, um, royalties, rehab, and then closure costs. The result is what's called an NPV. And that shows your cumulative NPV. And in fact, from this particular graph, um, and it's in discounted terms, you can read off your payback value, uh, time. And in this particular case, with the expenditure starting in 2016 and crossing the zero axis in 2022, you can add up the years and it's seven years. Okay, so let's move on quickly. Now I'm gonna hand over to Matthew to talk to this slide on discount rate. It's one that tends to be not very well understood. And often when I talk about project valuation, this is one where many, many questions come. Matthew, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks very much. And yes, indeed, good to join you on, on this, this session. I think um, you know, valuations is not something that people really understand uh, very well. I think people often view it as a complex uh, aspect of, of a project. And um, what, 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 when we talk about a model, we'll talk about how how we bring all these assumptions together to, to generate um, a realistic sort of set of numbers that, that one can use as tools to drive decisions um, that you've spoken about. But one of the key inputs for any valuation is, is what we call the, uh, the hurdle rate, discount rate, or the weighted average cost of capital. And essentially for, for those that don't know a lot about this, this concept, it really is um, a, a, a measure of risk or a, a, um, an input of risk 
um, mitigation that you put into your, your projects um, that would allow your, your directors or your shareholders, your stakeholders, your investors, the bankers to, to sort of measure a project's value relative, relative to where else they could get value. So simply put, um, investors have choices of investing money in government bonds where they get a, a so-called risk, risk-free return from the government. They could put money into, into commodities directly uh, and, they, and they, may view that, they may view there's a return there. They could invest it in, in the all share uh, index and get a, a sort of very balanced risk return on that. Um, but when you're dealing with specific projects, how do you measure the risk of that project relative to A, its peers, the industry, or the general um, uh, market itself? And, and this is quite fundamental in terms of, of how, how we do this. And as, as we've sort of highlighted here, there are a couple of um, tools we use to develop a, um, a discount rate for a project. Um, there's the so-called weighted average, weighted average cost of capital, which is the primary one um, that, that is, that is um, and I'll talk a little bit about that one, um, that generally uses what they call the capital asset pricing model um, to, to, to come up with discount rate. But on top of that, you've got to consider other risk factors that come into this. So just by, by virtue of an example, um, you know, weighted, weighted average cost of capital is exactly what it says. It's weighted average between the, the, the equity returns that investors would look at and the debt that a company could take on to, to invest in a project. So it's a balance on a percentage basis of how much equity versus how much, how much debt. Now, one borrows from, uh, you know, banks, it's, you know, whether it's US dollars or rands, um, you can borrow at a certain percentage, be it uh, prime plus or prime minus. You, you've got a, a typical cost of debt that, that you, could, you could borrow at. But the other question is, what is the cost of equity? What are your shareholders looking to get out of this? If it's a you know, gold project um, sitting in, in, in say, uh, Southern Africa or, or Western country, perhaps the, the risks are lower for that one. If it's a gold project sitting in um, you know, Ethiopia right now, well, there might be a bit more risk around that project. If it's a big bulk metals project like um, uh, iron ore, is the risk profile different? Would they expect a different return from this? Um, but essentially, investors are going to look for a higher return when they invest in a single project because their capital is going to be tied up for a much longer period of time. And it's not freely accessible uh, like it is buying shares on the market where you could sell your shares and move on. And projects, you can't just buy and sell uh, shares and get out. So you need to provide a, a reasonable return to shareholders, and that is dri driven by your, your cost of equity. Um, and essentially, there's a bit of an example here where, um, you know, you can look at the, the risk-free rate of, of 6%, um, or, or sorry, the co cost of capital, which is generally a risk-free rate plus, plus a premium, and you then add to that a country risk. Now, country risk is, is not an easy thing to measure. There are lots of these, these rating agencies that, that try, and, try and do it, and they provide sovereign, sovereign um, ratings based on credit, um, credit worthiness of those countries. That's, that's a tool that's used. It's sometimes more subjective. But you look at a, a country risk in terms of where you're investing. So um, it's quite important to factor that in. And the other thing that gets factored into, into discount rates is often um, a level of project risk. Now, ideally, ideally, you would like to factor in your project risk into your cash flow streams, which we'll talk about in the models. But if there's a lot of uncertainty around that, you then factor it into discount rate. And at the end of the day, the discount rate you use for your project is going to be that, um, that, that number that will generate the net present value um, for, for the project and guide you directors, the project managers, the shareholders on the actual long-term value of a, of a project. So I think that's that's in a nutshell what that, that that's saying. Thanks, Matt. That's excellent. Thank you. So what we're going to do now is just talk to a um, price and revenue assumptions. This is the model that Matthew is going to take you through. It's really important to um, understand what price to use in your model. And it's in some commodities, it's reasonably easy to actually determine this price um, when can use uh, either a, a single fixed price, which is your estimate of the future price. That's probably the most common way. However, uh, forward curves and analyst consensus forecasts are critical ones as well to, to look at. When one looks at many commodities though, it's very much dependent on the quality of the ore 
and the quality of the not only of the primary income element but of all your deleterious elements and i'll show you an example from iron ore it's also really important in bulk commodities to understand where the um, money has been paid where are you where you've been paid for the or whether it's a on a cif frb basis and various other uh, aspects fob for example free on board that you get paid when you deliver it cif usually on receipt by the customer and you need to be really careful to convert a prices to a common quality including the deleterious elements i'll show you what it, that looks like um, in a value in typical value in use calculation so this is for iron ore and you'll see at the top there that it has um, it's indexed to uh, iodex the platts assessment this one's uh, from a year or two ago and the product that you're looking to sell is at 61.5 lump and 60.3435 fines with that particular chemistry and the uh, benchmark is at 62 percent iron and 2.25 alumina 4 percent silica with no non fost and 0.02 sulfur so you can calculate your discount or your premium on lump and fines separately to that uh, benchmark price. And you can calculate the same discount and premiums to the various deleterious elements. And you'll see that your, although your um, original price is a little bit um, higher than what you would expect, once you calculate your discounts to iron and to your deleterious elements, you can see that the actual price that you're going to receive is probably a little bit lower. Now you can go through this in detail um, well, and I'm happy to share the spreadsheet that goes behind it uh, to those of you who are interested. The same principle applies to many of the bulk commodities like manganese, chrome, um, even coal is based on premiums and discounts. So let's look at the metrics that we use to, to measure our um, projects. Firstly, quantity. So net present value is a, is a measure of the, the quantum of value that we add to our company. Theoretically, any NPV greater than zero adds value to your shareholders. Practically, we would seldom do a... a um, project where your NPV is $1, so it would usually be higher than that. The internal rate of return is different. It measures often the quality of your investment, and it is the higher the number, of course, the better the investment. And we'll look a little bit more on internal rate of return. Payback is important because it's a measure of how long the investment needs to work before the company gets its cash back. It's usually measured in discounted terms, not under discounted, although most people will report discounted and undiscounted terms. And many investments are short payback in terms of years, will be associated with high capital efficiency ratio, which I'll show you now, and a high internal rate of return. The shortest um, capital, uh, shortest payback period I have come across was measured in days, the most maintain incredibly high grade Kimberlite pipe, or, and the longest I've seen has been up to about 15 years, which is a very, very long dated, a bulk commodity with very, very high capital of a rail, a mining rail and port. A very useful one, you might ask, is how do I rank my projects when I have a decision to make with capital constraints on which projects to develop? And the capital efficiency ratio is an exceedingly useful metric for ranking my projects. It is a simple calculation. It is measured from the ratio of the initial NPV, uh, the ratio of the NPV to the initial investment. And any capital efficiency ratio above about 0.3 and especially above about one is a very attractive investment. And 
anything below about 0.3, one would look very carefully at it um, if on its own, but you would certainly choose the projects uh, if I was capital rationed that, that had the higher capital efficiency ratio. As an aside on the bottom, the payback period can be linked to resource confidence. So many banks, as a rule of thumb, it's not built into any of our resource uh, reporting codes, would require a high level of measured or high level of confidence in the resource within the mine plan defined by the payback period. And that's a really important concept that's become fairly well established in the mining industry. So with that, I'm going to hand back to Matthew, I'm going to stop sharing my screen as well and hand it over to you to just take you through a simple manganese model and the key aspects of that. Over to you. Thank you, Max. Let me um, pull up the model for everyone. Okay. I'm assuming everyone can see that, Matt. I confirm you can, you can see that as well now. I, I can, yes. Oh, great. So, uh, again, go back to the sort of purpose of a model. Now, a substantial amount of work would have been done um, by, by a project team in coming up with a whole range of, of um, estimates for, for a project, one around a, a project mine plan, um, the capital estimates for the project, your, your costs, um, you would look at your sort of tax regimes, you, you, you come up with a whole range of inputs that would drive a, a project forward or certainly have, have, have an impact on the project. Now, again, not sure what level of experience the, the, the participants have got in, in valuations or working with models, but um, the fundamental purpose of a model is really to bring together um, all of the assumptions into a um, dynamic tool that allows you to measure, measure the value of, of a project and I guess test the um, robustness of, of the assumptions that have been uh, made for, for the project. Now, a model needs to be fit for purpose. And what, what I mean by that is, if you're doing a model at a, say, for example, a concept level study, um, you, you're going to have a range of different scenarios. Um, are you gonna process your ore? Are you gonna um, export your ore uh, raw? Are you going to um, build extensive infrastructure, roads, rail, or are you going to rely on existing infrastructure? Are you doing open pit? Are you doing underground? There's, there's a whole lot of, range of scenarios that you need to, to consider. And when you build your valuation model at the concept level, you need to run the scenarios uh, for, for that particular case. When you move further down the value, value chain uh, into, into your pre-fees or even fees, you, you start making um, definitive assumptions around what your project looks like. You will have defined that it's an open cast mine. You will have defined that it's, uh, uh, you're going to process or, or certainly beneficiate the, the, the ore on site. Um, you're going to export your, your ore uh, as a certain um, quality to, to, to a market. And what you're then trying to do is really test the robustness of your long-term assumptions in that to say, look, what if um, you know, I don't meet my production volumes? What if I exceed those? What if the market prices change? So, so your scenarios then change um, according to the level of project that you're you, you, You're freezing. Matthew, you frozen, just... Gugu, can you hear me? Hi, Matt. Yes, I you, Matt. Yeah. Okay, Matthew is frozen, so um, I'm not sure if he'll come back, but we can continue with the slides, but I'm not sure how to share my screen. Can I, if I, can I override it? I'll stop sharing his screen. I, okay, I can do it. Okay. Um, and I'll go back to the slide shares and then we'll come back to Matthew um, in a couple of minutes time. Okay, I'm just going to put it back onto slideshow mode. Okay, so what Matthew was, would have shown you, and we'll come back to it, is how to construct that model and look at the various options, and then to how to 
the various input parameters change the NPV of the and the internal rate of return of the project based on changes of discount rate, price, and production profile. What I want to just go on to at the moment is what is your expectation in terms of, let's say, the return on investment that you will get? Now, you're really taking, as Matthew said, risk into account through your discount rate. So let's say you're using an 8 or 10% discount rate. Out of the financial model, you'll get the internal rate of return of that particular project, as well as the other uh, metrics that we talked about. Now, that can be um, an IRR of anything. Let's see, the, the minimum I've seen is a couple of percent to the maximum of over 100, 150%. Typically, though, the internal rate of return is developed dependent on the project size. Often bigger projects have lower internal rate of returns, but more importantly, the internal rate of return is dependent on the um, whether it's greenfields or brownfields. Matthew, are you back? No, no, I am. Apologies. I'm not sure what's happened there. The choice of, of, of electronic communications, it just, just cut out. So I'm now back. Um, no worry. I'm going to go back to you. I just started on talking about internal rate of return. We've got enough time. So go back to the model. Sure. Not sure where I left everyone, but I'll go back to where I... Um, <clears throat> okay. You can, you can share your screen. Okay. Let's uh, do that. Right. So I, I was just sort of where, where I left off, I lost, I lost everyone. I was just saying that the model was fit for purpose. And, and, and you know, you've got to realize at what point you, you're you trying to test long-term assumptions. Um, and, and particularly as you get to uh, more um, definitive assumptions where you've got to make the large capital investments, you, you need to understand the robustness of your long-term sustainability of a project. Um, is it going to give you a long, longer life? Is it going to be a very short-term investment? Uh, as your strip ratio increases, are you going to be sustainable or not? Um, you know, commodity prices do do change over time, as Matt's mentioned. Um, what, you know, do your grades deteriorate over time? So, so again, you're looking at a longer term horizon of, of of a project, and it's very important for for the assumptions, the interplay between assumptions, to be made correctly. But then also to to understand in different combinations and different scenarios, what does the value of the project look like? So when we put a model together. We, we, we would typically um, start by, by listing um, a, a range of, of key assumptions. And for example, um, you, would, you would bring in your, your, your pricing assumptions. So in this case, you know, what, what are your annual pricing per year? You start with the January sort of start date and run through. And you'd have a, a forecast of pricing assumptions. Now, those assumptions are often um, developed internally by the larger, by larger corporates or you don't have that in-house capability, you, you would go to the, the, the banks and the analysts that do these sort of forecasts and um, you, you bring them into your models. You'd again bring in the range of pricing forecasts. But, but importantly, you've got to understand what does the price mean? It's not just the price you see, but there you'll see Matt alluded to is a CIF China. So in other words, that's the cost of creating insurance and freight in China. And you need to ensure that your model caters for that price with sea transportation and any land transportation back to your mine site. Uh, to be to be uh, comparable with with your valuation, um, you bring in all your other prices. You bring in your exchange rates. Um, you would then start bringing in scenarios of of, of primary mining inputs, your your production tonnages per year that you would like to achieve. You run some scenarios around those, saying, well, what if I get to two million tons and not to three million tons, uh, so forth and so on. Um, you would run some scenarios, for example, around mining losses. And a whole, a whole host of factors that you would uh, you would need to consider into this. And I don't, don't have the time to go through all the details of, of this, but um, you know, in the manganese space, for example, a critical one is um, is rail volumes. Do you, do you have access to rail? And if you don't, uh, your project could be uh, completely uh, lost to to, um, to that that sensitivity. You know, in South Africa, the, the rail is is controlled by by Transnet, and they allocate volumes based on a certain allocation mechanism. Now. Your, your board or your company or your, your sellers are going to invest in a project that's premised on you having rail access because without that, a road makes it very expensive. So these are critical, critical assumptions um, that one needs to think about in, in any project. Um, you would then look at your, your, your sort of split between fines and lump in this case, and these are bulk commodities like manganese. Um, in, your, in your copper, it would, be, it would be about your recoveries and so forth. Um, you would... Um, 
you would then look at your grade because your mining plan is going to deliver a grade of grade profile of all. So it's very important that you're able to test the grade profiles um, across across the line. And the other little things that come into this, um, you know, your, your your moisture content because again you're railing you're railing moisture. So any if you've got high moisture content, you, you're going to pay for water to be transported down down the rail. It's, it's a weight. So these are important considerations to bring into your uh, uh, to bring into your your, your models. You then run all your scenarios around mining costs, upside cases, downside cases, base cases, and it, it varies. Um, and these are all linked. And it's important to, to link your 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 your, 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 your model correctly with, with volumes and so forth. Um, and then, and then just scrolling down, you know, you do bring in all your other costs, your your selling costs, um, marketing costs, your processing costs, uh, logistics costs. Um, you bring in other indirect costs. So um, those are, for example. Uh, overhead costs, insurance costs, um, there may be um, you know, social labor costs, things that are not necessarily directly related to the project, um, but, but they do have a bearing on, on the value, value of that. Um, you bring in your corporate overhead costs if you're a large corporate. Um, again, you, you, you have shareholder costs that need to be incurred uh, to, to run a project, so these need to come in. Um, uh, again, you would need to look at your um, Closure costs, for example, what uh, and that's something that I think you've seen in the press a lot um, around what is the cost of closing mines. Um, it is usually, from a valuation perspective, put at the end of the life, so discount back is pretty small. But again, in in, in real terms, that that, that that is a fairly substantial cost for a mine to have to 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 bear in mind. You look at the capital assumptions, the growth capital, your sustaining capital, and sustaining is quite a an important uh, cost that people often overlook because. It's, it's around reinvesting in your, your infrastructure in the mine, your equipment, um, your, your maintenance and so forth. And, and that's got to be well, well considered because often that is overlooked and, and can, can materially alter the value of a project. So the whole range of key assumptions you'd put in there. And they would then culminate in a model which calculates um, a, 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 um, a series of cash flows. You'll have your um, production cash flows which generates the revenue. Have your costs, which generates the, the total mine site costs. Um, you then have a, have a, have a um, other other costs like royalties, taxes, and so forth that comes in, and you have a capex, um, and that ultimately you would then arrive at what is called a um, a net present value. All right now, a net present value, as 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 Matt alluded to, is really the inherent value of a project that, that would be realizable to shareholders. In other words, if you had to invest. Uh, your capital, you'd get your capital back, plus you would get a, uh, a, a, a at your waste 8% return, you'd get $142 million of, of, of value back on this project. So um, it's important to see that's over and above what you would invest. And the bigger the number, obviously, the better uh, your, your, your value of a project, but um, it's important to understand where is that value. So, for example, in the discounted cash flow, you'll see. Um, you've got a couple of years of negative cash flow because of the capital investments, and then you start generating reasonable returns and it drops off quite materially towards the back end. Now you would then intuitively look at your, at your valuation and say, should I run a mine? Is it worth running a mine for a $4 million cash flow uh, going out for, for, for several years? Maybe not. It tests sensitivities. But you may find some models that have got very high values at the back end and very low values in the front as you're going through shipping and you're going through a lot of waste and perhaps low grade areas. And that means the, the returns are going to be delayed. And, and so those are important to, to consider um, in any project. And that's why a model gives you a very good snapshot or a very good picture as a tool um, to look at decisions and understand what your project is going to, to, to generate. Um, now, what, what you then do with that is you build yourself a range of sensitivities and scenarios. Now, we've spoken about discount rates, so you would then decide on a calculated discount rate or, or a range of, of rates that, that might be applicable, and uh, you would put those in as sensitivities. You could choose other key value drivers, um, particularly the big ones are around price. Um, they often drive large value swings in, in, in the business. Uh, exchange rates um, are another one that uh, do that. Um, we've spoken about rail volumes, for example. They, they are big revenue drivers um, and often drive in the manganese space, drive um, a lot of value. Less of a risk in your, in your gold space where, where most of your product can be easily moved through, um, 
uh, you know, normal transportation means or helicopters, you don't need to bulk, 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 bulk volumes. So th those are important. You then bring in your um, computation on royalties. Um, you, you look at your sensitivities around um, costs and capex. Um, another thing I didn't really talk about, but it's not huge, but understand working capital because the first few years of a new project, you've got to fund op ongoing operating expenses and fully generate sufficient revenue. So working capital becomes important for those type of projects. And you build a little sensitivity feed that allows you then, for example, to flex um, in the scenario one, you've got an NPV of 142 million. Um, you know, if, and that's under 8% discount rates. It's got our internal view of manganese prices, your internal view of exchange rates. Um, if, you, if you go and change it, say, for example, to, oh, to, to, to a scenario three, that's got a higher discount rate of 12%. It's got internal rate of, of manganese prices, but a base case analyst sort of, and that generates a higher NTV, for example. Um, so I'm not sure why the IRR is not reflecting there, but it shows you that certain assumptions would generate a higher value. And you go back to your model and you look at the cash flows and say, all right, well, I'm seeing higher, higher values now uh, due to perhaps the, the, the market on, on prices relative to your, uh, your internal view on, 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 on exchange rates and prices. So it's very important to run and test those, those sort of sensitivities with, with the model. Um, and again, this, you bringing those together, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this at the end of the, of the, of the slide pack, but it's important to understand what the range of values will be. Um, you cannot pinpoint a value on one number because one number is meaningless on its own um, and, and a valuation has got to be talked about in a range um, and the range needs to be underpinned by um, a set of assumptions or criteria that are, um, that are, that are assumed and, and well understood and defendable in, in, in evaluation. So Matt, I think, I think in a nutshell, that's, that's um, you know, model is, 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 can go on for hours and hours on this. Um, but I think given our time limitation, let's just leave it at that. And if there are any questions uh, from, from the, from the um, team, uh, we, we, can, we can discuss them at the end. Matthew, thanks very much. Um, I see some excellent questions coming through that I want to make sure that we have enough time to, to be able to answer at the end. So let's, let's finish off. Um, sorry. I'm just sharing my screen again. And I was talking about internal rate of return. And if on the left-hand side is a, is a, a suite of, of projects with the internal rate of return with copper equivalent, we haven't talked about that, but um, many metals we convert to an equivalent and copper equivalents are a very common way of doing it to be able to compare across uh, copper to iron ore to whatever. And you can see for greenfield projects, um, any IRs up to 20%. Brownfields, on the other hand, where you're sharing infrastructure that has already been paid for to a large extent, um, the internal rate of returns can be anything from 50 to 100%. An example closer to home would be, this is from a recent Anglo Platinum presentation, and you can see they've given us here the capital expenditure. So these are substantial uh, projects, uh, up to 1.3 billion Rand at Mandelbilt. You can see the payback periods, two, two, three, three, five. And importantly, the, you can see the internal rate of return, anything up to 60%. Gives you an idea of the incredible value generation capacity of the minerals industry, particularly in periods of higher prices. If we look at the brownfields expansions over time, your internal rate of return for successive expansions can increase considerably. This is an example from the Pilbara with the IRR uh, increasing up to 15% in total from investments of over $20 billion. And to, just to finish off, so we can have a couple of minutes for our questions. Um, we, we mentioned that the capital industry is capital intensive. It is, it's one of the few industries that is, it puts, sets us apart from many, many other industries. And it is also dealing with a wasting asset, which also sets it apart. And we spend a lot of money on capital. I think 200 billion is, is probably an underestimate itself. Every decision has to be, um, every valuation has to underpin a decision. Next one is that valuation practitioners come from a number of different environments. I'm a geologist and Matthew is a mining engineer, but they could also come just as easily from the financial world itself. 
critical thing is to understand the, the all body. Every valuation I've worked on is different depending on that all body and the individual characteristics of that all body. We need to take the, the deleterious elements into, into account as well. It's so critical and we often don't do that. And the final point, which is really the most important point on this slide, <clears throat> and Matthew spoke about it, <clears throat> was that our all body estimates and our mind schedules aren't precise calculations, they're estimates, and the uncertainty needs to filter through to the final financial metrics. We haven't shown you the Monte Carlo analysis that one can overlay on the financial models. It is very popular in many, many different circles. But this on the right hand side shows you a distribution of net present values. And key thing there in the red, you'll see that's the zero, NPV zero. So you can work out that your probability of your NPV is greater than zero. Um, amongst many other factors you can get from a, a Monte Carlo analysis of the financial side is the understanding of risk associated with the project. I'd, I'd like to turn to the questions, um, Matthew, unless you'd like to add anything on that side. No, no Matt, I, th I think that's, that's perfect. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the range of, of scenarios will generate this range of, of values. And I think importantly, this while this looks like a fairly normal distribution, in other words, there's an equal chance upside and downside. That's not always um, the case in mining projects. You may find a very big skew to the left or the right, and that that hinders on the on the risk of the project. So a highly skewed left uh, left sort of um, distribution means that there's a higher uh, risk related to the project um, than, than potential upside. So that, that that's important of, of Monte Carlo simulations to run multiple scenarios in combination to really understand the, the risk, and, risk of the and, project. And remember as well, every single input parameter you can put into a Monte Carlo simulation can be a distribution, not necessarily a single point value, whether it's grades, tonnages, recoveries, capital costs, operating costs. And it's quite important to actually get those in as distributions. Okay, let's, let's turn to a couple of questions. Uh, Matthew, I'm gonna hand this over to you to answer the first one. What are the main factors of country risk premium? So the, the, the main factors really relate to, um, uh, the, 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 I guess, I suppose we all, we all understand this in, in, in an African context, I suppose, and in, in sort of, I suppose, third world context is your, your um, the risk around tenure and, and, uh, and the retention of that tenure of your, of your business. Um, you know, so often we'll see mining projects get started in a, a country where, where the regime seems to be stable, um, but, but there's volatility in, in, in the sort of government and political sphere that results in destabilization and loss of, loss of, loss of tenure and loss of mineral rights. Um, we saw that in Zambia in the 70s. We've seen that in, the, in, the, in the Uganda with Idi Amin. We've seen that in, in multiple jurisdictions, Venezuela, where the, where the nationalization of, 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 of projects has taken place. So, you know, country risk really is a starting point is your ability to, to see your project through from start to finish. And uh, when I say finish, to, to extract your, your full value of the life of the project and get your money back plus the returns that you expect to get. Um, in a, in a, in a high-risk project world, you, you want to ensure that you get your money back as quickly as, at least your money back as quickly as possible. Um, and that's important to have a payback that's, that's earlier. So the key factor is, is your sustainability. The second one is around your uh, stability of, of the operating environment. So while you may not lose your mineral rights, uh, are you going to face, um, um, for example, uh, massive labor challenges or um, uh, royalty changes or operating environment changes that, that result in your costs being higher? And that, those are things that you all need to factor in um, to, to your country risk, um, particularly for, for the longer term. I hope that that gives a, a reasonable yeah, you know, that's, answer. That's good. And uh, do you want to do the next one? What confidence do we have on the mine closure costs at the feasibility stage of a project? Okay. Mine closure is, again, a very hot topic because um, it does, it's a negative cash flow for anybody. Um, in, the, in the past, it has always seemed as a, you know, we, we'll deal with it um, in, 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 in 20 years' time when we get to it. So, we don't need to worry too much today about what the value of it is. You know, the mines are going to generate a sufficient cash flow to, to manage this. 
But um, th that is changing quite dramatically today where um, governments and, and regulatory bodies are looking to get up front a detailed closure estimate. Um, and it's, it's got to be underpinned by, by rigorous and defendable assumptions and, um, and not just how much, but not just the why, but how, how are you going to go about the rehabilitation as well? So often projects do not get approved by regulatory bodies um, until those closure estimates are, um, are done. Um, and again, it's always a moving target. As, as we evolve, we see, for example, South Africa, the NEMA regulations are now changing how um, environmental closures take place because, you know, again, governments are learning from the past, realizing that you can't just you know, create a, a dam for, for wastewater, you need to line the dam or you need to um, you know, cover, uh, cover tailings dumps properly to, to avoid um, you know, climate changes, uh, uh, heavy storms washing cap uh, capping and cu covering over. So there's a whole lot of things that we're learning and changing. And so at the concept level, it, it should be fairly robust, um, but not to say it doesn't change. Thank you. And I'll, I'll cover off on the next two. Um, firstly, what confidence do we have in the commodity prices, especially when we try to estimate them in a boom? The Part of the answer to that is that we, we need to look at forward curves. So for many exchange traded funds or for many commodity, bulk commodities, we have forward curves for them. That gives us a very good idea in the short term, in other words, six to 12 months, maybe a bit more, whether prices are coming off or whether they're looking at increasing. Um, and then to do our estimate of the future based on our own estimates, our marketing people, and also on taking into account what analysts feel um, the prices are going to do. They, they do a lot of work on this and looking at analyst forecasts uh, really does help. The important thing here is to not have a single price that we build into our models, but preferably to have a low, a mid and a high price. The, the second one um, is that uh, the question on how do smaller companies avoid um, doing their projects wrong so that they end up going bust. The key thing that I have to say is that smaller companies tend to be capital constrained. So they're always trying to save money on the, on the project development costs, on exploration, on concept study pre-fees and feasibility, my experience, trying shortcuts, trying to cut corners invariably comes back to bite us. Your chances of success of a project is so much better if you do it by the rules. You don't have to do it the expensive way, but not uh, cutting corners. And follow those seven um, guidelines, uh, points that I showed you earlier. Single point accountability, continuity of staff, Make sure that someone checks your work so the governance side is done and the other points that were raised. I think there was one other. Um, no, just, to, just to add on that question yeah, from Mandel, okay. long term long term value is um, if you are valuing in a boom, um, you, you, it's a very important to test the long run uh, mean, what's called long run mean reversion price. So if you test the low uh, series of lower prices, um, you get to a point where your project doesn't make economic sense. And those prices, they need to be looked back and say, well, in, in a range of, of commodity prices that have, have occurred in that commodity over the past 10 years, you know, where do you sit in that range? And if you, if you feel that price is at the top end of the range, you're probably at a high risk. If that price is at the bottom end of the lower range and you're still economically financially viable, then your project has got a good chance of success and survive, and survive bankruptcy in the low price environment. Now, I, I am aware that we did we did uh, rush the questions a little bit and we could actually add to some of those. So if anyone wants to go over a couple of minutes, we, we're quite happy to do that, um, Matthew, if that's okay with you. That's perfect with me. I see there's another question from Star there on uh, environmental. Uh, this, is, this is a really big one. Well, do you want to kick off and, and I'll add to it? Let, let me let me try and kick that off, and, and then you can add to it. Indeed, um, so uh, I think I think this is a very important question, and, and they are getting very strict across the world. Um, again, we we see in climate change and climate risk being a problem, um, but but we often see in our own backyards how much destruction we are causing by by mining projects. Um, often communities now have a bigger voice, and things like dust pollution, noise pollution, um, water pollution are um, are very prominent. Um, so 
it's very difficult to you know estimate this risk other than knowing what your project uh, what the risks of your project are so if you're dealing with a iron ore mine in the middle of northern cape uh, where, where there's no there's no rain or very little rain it's not a commodity that really generates any particular pollution um, it's not going to contaminate groundwater but there's a bit of dust and dust pollution might be your, your big one um, so, so the risks there are low but when you're dealing in more densely um, uh, populated areas or urbanized areas and we're seeing this up in Africa where mines are being set up in, in areas that are quite sort of populated of people um, these risks become uh, greater because you are there is the risk of, of, of jumping on the copper or, or coal um, you know the, the water poisoning is becoming a very um, common common risk uh, or common theme and, and are dealing with that and we've got solutions they are just very expensive and, and the question is can you run those solutions for the rest of your life. I mean, to try and treat water into per perpetuity um, is, is almost impossible. Um, you know, I don't think anybody runs a, a rehabilitation program into perpetuity. You hope nature then sort of normalizes. But um, it's difficult to, to measure that risk. So besides the fact of the closure costs, which we tend to estimate are not very well, though we are getting better at it, the rehabilitation, ongoing rehabilitation can be costed. And we can we can build that into our models. From a community relations point of view, I know that many companies put in a percentage of revenue for community relations at the project stage, and then define it much uh, more uh, closely as they get into development of the project and into an asset. That is increasingly receiving a lot more scrutiny. Um, now, you talk about the environmental and community relations side, but there's also the G side, the governance side, and that increasingly is going to become a, an issue in minerals projects. And I am aware that JORC, for example, is looking at rewriting their rules um, and guidelines to include a lot more on the ESG guidance side. PERC, which is the European code, has recently come out with a new code, which is well worth a read in terms of what they are looking to require on the um, on the ESG side, and I know that Samrec as as well as looking at it and Crisco. The, the the key thing though is to try and value the ESG the, and and maybe separate them out and try and put a cost to them so that we build the that cost into our financial model so we completely and adequately. Uh, estimate what it's going to cost us uh, or investors and shareholders to adequately address the ESG risks. Okay, I think, are there any other open questions at all? Any, any more questions that come through? I think we've answered them all. No open questions. So I'm just going to stop sharing my, my screen. And just leads me to say thank you very much to all of you. Uh, some super questions. I really do. We really do appreciate them. And really, it was, it's been an absolute privilege for us to present um, to you here today. Hopefully, we've spared a, spared a lot of interest in in the subject of project evaluation. Um, Matthew, leave you with a couple of final words. Well, thanks, Matt. Yes, it, it's, it's a very, um, for me, it's a very passionate area. Um, and again, it just requires, I think, people to really think about the long-term um, dynamics of your, of your project. And it's all good while saying the cost is going to be 100 million to set up and mining costs are 20 around a ton and so forth. But, you know, what does that mean long-term and, sustain, and sustainably so? So um, I think anybody who gets involved in the space, um, it, it's, it's very rewarding as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an area to, to focus on. Um, and, and often one can't articulate it well enough. Um, <laughs> you've got to talk about so many uh, multiple factors and so many things. And not everyone understands Monte Carlo simulations. Um, you know, we always struggle with auditors, for example. They don't quite understand the whole Monte Carlo simulation side. So different stakeholders have different needs and, 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 and valuations are a great tool to try and address those needs. So um, very happy to, to answer any questions privately. Um, our, our details are, I think, on the presentation, or if they're not, we can give them from the SIMM. I'm very happy to, to, to take some calls or, uh, or an email if need be, if anyone needs to understand a bit more, would like to get involved with these things more in their careers. 
I'm very happy to share my, my guidance and thoughts and experience. Thank you very much. As I said in the beginning, the presentation and the model will be distributed to all attendees. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matthew. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye.